Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Judy Van Ress, and I'm executive vice president of the International Republican Institute. And on behalf of IRI, I am pleased to welcome you to this session of our Democratic Governance Speaker Series. It's a forum designed to bring policymakers and practitioners together to discuss challenges to governance and to share experiences in meeting those challenges. Like other regions of the world, in Latin America and the Caribbean, democratic institutions face persistent challenges. From security threats to poor service delivery and corruption, citizens have little trust in institutions that, in many cases, often fail to deliver. As part of an institute-wide program, IRI initiated democratic governance in Latin America in early 2007, funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. Through these programs, IRI works alongside mayors, governors, civil servants, and other government officials to encourage transparent, accountable, and responsive governing practices. In addition, IRI educates citizens on their role in the process, helps local civil society organizations con contribute to policy design and oversight, and empowers media to more accurately serve in the public's interest. Today, we will discuss the use of information and communications technology in support of democratic governance, or as we call it, smart governance. We hope to gain a better appreciation and understanding of how technology can be applied as a tool to strengthen democratic institutions, improve democratic processes, ultimately transforming the way citizens interact with their government. It is my great pleasure to introduce Constance Barry Newman, who will moderate today's panel discussion. Connie has an enormously impressive background. While she has focused on issues affecting Africa, her experience is wide-ranging, encompassing law, business, and government. Some highlights of her career include serving as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. She acted as President Bush's G8 personal representative on Africa, playing an advisory role to the Secretary of State and guide, guiding the operation of the U.S. diplomatic establishment in the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa. Prior to that, she was the Assistant Administrator for Africa at USAID and led efforts to administer economic and humanitarian assistance in Africa. In addition to several other government positions, such as overseeing the U.S. Civil Service and managing the Smithsonian Institution, Connie was a successful business owner, and she has hands-on experience with the issue of governance when she served as a board member and vice chair of the District of Columbia's Financial Responsibility and Management Assistant Authority. Connie has helped IRI in a variety of programs, including governance. When this spring, she spoke and participated in IRI's second regional Smart Governance Summit, implementing best practices and lessons learned in El Salvador. While there, Connie met with our partners and practitioners and was exposed to several low-cost, innovative initiatives designed to enhance citizen government communication, that is, citizen outreach via social media, and municipal services with the use of database platforms to streamline bureaucratic processes. I want to thank Connie for taking time out of her busy schedule to share her thoughts on governance and to moderate today's discussion. Connie. Good morning. Good morning. That was weak. Good morning. <laughs> There's coffee here. Uh, I think it looks like you all need that. Um, welcome to the International Republican Institute's uh, Democratic Governance Speakers Series. And as you know, and Judy uh, reminded you that you are in the right place if you intended to be at a series on governance in Latin America and the Caribbean. Democratic institutions all over the world now have the opportunity to address many of their challenges through information and communication technology. Wherever there are service delivery problems, security threats, corruption, and general distrust of government, 
there exists innovative information technology tools or could exist, which is what this is all about. The use of those tools, as Judy said, is called smart governance. And the benefit of those tools is not just for the people running the government, but in, more importantly, it's the benefit of the citizens uh, where they are being used. In April of this year, I had the opportunity to attend the IRI Summit on Smart Governance in El Salvador, where participants from El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala shared ideas, and they shared ideas about how to face security challenges using mobile technology for public safety. They talked about how to enhance citizens' communication through ICT tools, social networks, web and mobile apps, and internet radio systems, and how to make municipal transactions easier, streamline, and make them more efficient thereby increasing citizen services. Today, today we have the good fortune to hear from three experts on the topic of smart governance, their challenges and their opportunities. Um, our first speaker is Diego Peixoto. He's currently an open government specialist at the World Bank. He's worked there for 12 years as a practitioner and researcher in the field of ICT and in governance. Prior to joining the bank, he managed projects and worked as an advisor and consultant for various organizations in the field of participation and technology, such as the European Commission, OECD, United Nations, the Brazilian and UK governments. He is also a research coordinator of the Electronic Democracy Center, which is a joint venture of European University Institute, the University of Zurich, the Oxford Internet Institute of the University of Oxford. It is a great pleasure for me now uh, to introduce you. I don't know if you want to be up here or there. Okay. Okay. Good morning. Um, thank you, uh, Connie. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, also with uh, Miguel, colleague, and with the mayor of Cancax. And of course, I'd like to thank the IRI for this generous invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So my presentation is a bit long, a bit improvised because of the recent wave of protests in Brazil. Of course, I could not be indifferent to that, so I had to make some adaptation at the end. But okay, so let's start. So what I'm going to be talking is basically about the use of technologies in citizen participation and taking cases of Brazil. And at some point, I'm going to focus on a very particular state uh, in Brazil, which is the state of Rio Grande do Sul. You're going to be hearing about it in a minute. But first of all, a bit of history. So how is it working? Which way should I point it to? Is it on? Oh, good. All right. Okay, so a bit of history first. So there's this uh, political theorist and um, great scholar, one of the major scholars in, 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 in ancient democracies called Josiah Ober, and he wanted to see why Athens as a city-state, uh, classical Athens, that's 5 uh, BC, uh, why it performed better than other city-states. Because Athens, let's say, despite its smaller uh, size and uh, disadvantages in terms of economic resources and everything, it performed much better. It outperformed every other city in terms of arts, culture, economically, and in the military. You know? So he goes and makes almost like an archaeological uh, research, and what he finds is that Athens achieved higher than otherwise expected performance through better than usual information processing 
capacity by transforming raw data and unprocessed information into politically valuable knowledge. So basically, they had a way to leverage the knowledge that was dispersed amongst the Athenians, and hence that intelligence could make them outperform. But how did they do that? I won't, I, I will spare you the history class here, even though because I'm not good at that, but what he finds out, it was participatory institutions. So there were institutions through it, you could channel citizens' knowledge, which would let people know how to better manage the state, and then lead to the development outcomes at the time in Athens. No? So here I'm gonna talk about some participatory institutions of nowadays, how they look. No? So first of all, I'm gonna talk about two types, uh, participatory budgeting and collaborative policy making. Starting quickly with participatory budgeting, how many of you have heard about participatory budgeting? Okay, so participatory budgeting uh, is basically a practice that was born in Brazil in 89 at the local level, in which basically the government takes a part of its investment money and gives it to the citizens and lets citizens decide where the money should go. Bear in mind this is not budget consultation. Budget consultations normally are exercises of selective hearing. No? We ask citizens what they want, then they tell us they, what they want to do, and then when it's convenient for us, we say, listen, we're listening to you. Participatory budgeting citizens really decide where the money goes. If they say, let's burn the money, the money has to be burned. Hasn't happened so far, but this is the way it works. So. How does it work? So basically you invite citizens from, a, from a, a certain district of the city and you invite them to uh, these big assemblies like this that you can see in a stadium in the south of Brazil. And citizens come and they start to say what are their needs. Mm -hmm. They decide on the priorities they vote, so it's kind of like a offline crowdsourcing effort in which citizens will decide where the money should go. And then those decisions, after they vote, the government, the municipal government or the state government will execute it. Of course, after citizens do that, they will also follow where the money goes. So there's also a dimension of transparency. So here you have a city in Brazil that basically the mayor paints the budget on the walls of the city saying where the money comes from on the first line and last one where the money is going to. So if we talk, talk a lot about that we should go where the people are and then sometimes we think of social media but people are on the streets as well. So it is a good thing. Um, participatory budgeting actually, uh, even though it's not very well known, uh, it's quite widespread. In 2010, there were about 1470 participatory budgetings around the world. Now in 2013, the latest estimates are about uh, 200, 2,500 participatory budgeting spread around the world, including in the United States, uh, Chicago, Vallejo in California, and New York. But why does it matter? So participatory budgeting has been around for quite a while. So there's, it's probably one of the participatory governance innovations that have been the most studied. You go to Google Scholar, you put participatory budgeting and you're gonna be shocked how many evaluations have been made. So we do have some knowledge about it. And here, that's what a brief literature of review would show you. When participatory budgeting is well done, first of all, it can lead to reduction in tax evasion. I've had this very own experience in the Democratic Republic of Congo. What happens is that when citizens start to do that they cannot do more because the state doesn't have enough money, they might be more willing to pay taxes. Also, they start to see where the money going. So you have several experiences where you see a reduction of tax evasion. Improved budget planning and evaluation. Budgets, particularly in developing countries, is a piece of fiction. With participatory budgeting, they have to manage expectations, so they start to do more realistic budgets. Uh, improved access to public services, particularly services that affect the poor, like water, sewage, and so on. Reduction in poverty rates, econometric studies looking at that, and also, surprisingly, reduction in child mortality, because mothers attend the meetings and they start to demand more and more investment in prenatal and uh, uh, early child care. <coughs> so, if participatory budgeting is a good thing, you must be wondering, where is the technology? So, uh, I'm gonna say where technology is used in two aspects of participatory budgeting. Uh, one, in the mobilization of citizens, and two, in remote participation. So here's an, an example of a city that we did in 
2004, an example uh, that I worked at the time with the European Commission in the city of Ipachinga in Brazil. Basically, what we want is more people participating in the process, because the more people participate in the process, the more you're leveraging collective intelligence. The whole idea, the whole exercise is about collective intelligence. So the more diversity of views you have, the better the process is. So what we wanted to do was to increase participation. We decided to do an experiment. Uh, so we divided the city, the city basic, basically in half. We had four districts. Some were treatment groups, other control groups. So what were these treatment groups? Were districts where we would send a message or a voice message with the voice of the mayor inviting people to attend the participatory budgeting meeting. He would say, hey, hello, today at school, St. Peter's at seven o'clock, why don't you come decide where your money should be going? We did that in half of the city, the other half of the meetings we did not do. We sent about like 34,000 geo-targeted calls, basically new people's address, associated a number, and SMS. So what did we find? we find 30% more participation in treatment groups. So we could see that the mobile was an extremely effective means to mobilize people to participate. But how does it work compared to other means of communication? Because at the time, the city was spending lots of money on TV. The mayor will send a postal mail to everybody, ev to every household. There was like announces in newspapers, announces in radio. So we wanted to see how these different means of communication compared in terms of mobilized citizens to participatory democracy. So here are the results. Over 55% of the people said that was the phone call or the SMS that motivated them the most to attend the meetings. Then in second, you have the postal mail with only 7.2%. If you look at TV, it's 5.3%. The thing is, TV at that time cost at least 100 times more than it cost us to send the SMS. So here's a lesson that doesn't go just for participatory budgeting, but it might be considering that SMS might be a much better way to mobilize people than any other type of media. Of course, depend on intervention and so on. Another thing to do is reduce the participation costs. No? So we can mobilize people, but the other thing is how to get people really to participate or make it easier for them to participate. When you talk about participation, we think kind of like this view of people participating, super happy. It's kind of like that view of like Tocqueville when he came to America, you no, know, like the, that vibrant civil society and so on. But I mean, particularly in developing countries, that's how participation looks, up, looks like. You know, this is the metro in Sao Paulo. So right after a long day of work, you know, you go at five at home, at six, seven, takes you two hours, and then you wanna go to a meeting full of people where you don't have seats and you have to take your babies. So what happens is, you have high participation costs. When I'm talking about participation costs are the transactional costs incurred by the act of participation. And the higher the participation costs, the lower the participation is. If you wanna test that, just per, per, put barbed wires around polling stations and you're gonna see less people are gonna vote. Um, <clears throat> so let me give you an example. The city of Belo Horizonte is a city in, in my state in Brazil, uh, the capital of the state. Um, it's a city quite big, 2.4 million inhabitants. It has a participatory budgeting of $43 million. So people basically decide on $43 million where the money should go. But the participation levels in the city is extremely low. It's 1.5% of the people participate. And that's pretty much the average of participation in Brazil. Uh, so in 2006, the city said, well, let's try something different. Let's create the digital participatory budgeting. What was this digital participatory budgeting? So they created an additional budget of 11 million. So that's a parallel process with 11 million where people would vote exclusively through the internet to decide on the location of, at the time, $11 million. So I could vote on like fixing a hospital, fixing a new square, building a library, and so on. All the projects were at the value of 1.2 million. Yeah? So how did it work? First of all, in Brazil, not everybody has access to the internet. So first of all, what happens is that you had like wide, uh, widespread access provided by supporters. So sometimes you had like the priest in the church and they would put a computer and they would say, oh, and on your way out of the mess, don't forget to vote for that public work in our neighborhood that is really important and so on. <clears throat> you had like small businesses also advocating and so on. 
you have 178 internet points spread around the city with trained personnel. These trained personnel were locals, kids who go to school and know how to deal with computer, no fancy kiosks or anything like that. And um, also there was a bus, a bus equipped with internet which would go around the city with the, the, the areas with biggest uh, digital uh, exclusion. So voting period of 42 days. So it was quite different of the other participatory budgeting where you have to go at a certain time, at a certain place to vote. So what was the result? The result was 173,000 participants. That was about 10% of citizens and about like let's say 18% of electors in the, in the city. What was interesting is that even though the process was done exclusively through the internet and in Brazil, most people at particularly at the time did not have access to the internet, the highest turnout were still in the poorest areas. So even though people did not have access to the internet, when there was something at stake for them, they found a way of doing it and we have some data on that. I'm gonna try to move. What is interesting is when you compare them, I hope you can read the numbers, but if you take the, participat the traditional participatory budget, which is totally analogic, the budget is $43 million and you only get 1.5% of participants. In the digital one, with a budget nearly four times smaller, you get over six times more participation, 11 million and 10% of the people do. So here we, I think we have like a compelling case for reducing the costs of participation when it comes to participatory governance. Quick another example here, uh, here's the state of Rio Grande do Sul, which um, I have the pleasure to work with. So last year we did, a participatory budgeting process in which you could vote in the buses, where the money is going, on the internet, paper ballots of course, multi-channel, so people can also vote on paper ballots, and through mobile. So it is a state with 11 million people. In 36 hours, we got 1.2 million participants, people coming and voting, saying where the budget should go. Participation rate of 18%. For those who participate with, for those who work with participatory democracy, this rate is extremely, extremely high, particularly when you're talking about large policies, large states. <coughs> So, but who participates? So we ran a survey with the people who were voting online. 23,000 people answered to that survey. And here's just like a little snapshot of the results. No, 18.5% of the people who were voting online, they were not internet users. That's extremely interesting because they prefer to, to go through the internet was more convenient to them than going to one of the bad, bad ballots in the center. They just find a way by proxy, asking somebody to do them and so on. Um, the other thing is that of the people that participate, we ask like, well, if the vote was not available through the internet, would you still have voted? No, 63% say, no, I would not have voted. Because normally, democ some democratic theorists say, people, if they want to participate, they'll participate anyway. Adding technology won't make a difference. So here you have kind of like quite a different results where more than two thirds say, no, I would not participate if you didn't make my life easier. So what is interesting is that of those people who did not participate, okay, uh, you'd say, well, these are not very active people. But when we look at them after they participated, they went on to social networks and shared content inviting other people to participate. So even though they're not willing to be active offline, once they participate online, they're also becoming like multiplying agents. And these are people that when we're looking to their participation in civic activities, most of them could be considered politically dead prior to that day. So they didn't do absolutely anything. They didn't call the government, they wouldn't complain, they don't talk about politics, they don't care about politics. Then you make it easy for them to participate, they participate and they share network on the contents and invite people. I'm about to conclude now very quickly. Collaborative policy making, another initiative in state of Rio Grande do Sul that we, we are proud of, uh, which refers to um, citizen participation in policy. So for instance, in this initiative, the governor asks, the governor wanted to know what were the priorities for health in the state. So what we did is say, well, let's create a platform in which people can create ideas and vote on their own ideas of what they want for health in the state. We try to make as inclusive as possible. Here again, buses with computers equipped and also mobile phone voting. 
So what were the results of that? First of all, here we have like 122,000 votes uh, and about 1,400 proposals. And these proposals, as people vo vote, they go up to the pop to the top now. So we here we see like, for instance, people asking Medicare, most of them are concerned about Medicare. We see that Americans' concerns are somehow related to Brazilians' concerns. And um, then we brought all this, or already the system kind of like, the, 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 the team brought this to the governor. So here's the policy change. Here's what the gov the change that happened really, because uh, again, it's not consulting people. It's kind of like, it's not listening to people. It's about being able to respond to them. So here just for instance, 166% of increase in the allocation of primary health care, um, $44 million in allocation for a family health program and so on. So it, we, we really have like, we can really create a causal link between the participatory process and the policy change that happened. Now, just to conclude, you must be thinking, but if everything is so beautiful in Brazil, why are you guys so mad in protesting all the time, no? <laughs> So um, first of all, I wanted to put this picture here uh, for you to see, because I think international media, as a Brazilian here observing, international media is great to show people burning cars and everything, but uh, that is just a minority. Most of the protest protests are about these people, you know, like they're young, they're students, and they want to make a difference. And if you look at their demands, actually, it is about less corruption, they want better services, but one of the demands that nobody talks about, but it's in their mouth, is more participation. They want to participate more still. So when we look at that, just to give an example, because the protests started in Sao Paulo because of an increase of 20 cents in the bus tickets. So here, people started to kind of like stigmatize, I know about 20 cents and you guys are going to the streets. So here you, you got like this campaign that is started in Rio that says, it's not for 20 cents, it's for 20 billion. We want participatory budgeting in Rio. So these are people really asking for more participation for more space. But how did the state normally respond to that demand for more participation? With the shock, shock troops. This has been the rule and this has been what led to a bigger wave of protests. Nowadays there's a big consensus in Brazil that was the response of the police, which actually led to a growth uh, in, the, in the protests even more or just at least accentuated. But not everybody's doing that. So again, Rio Grande do Sul, the governor of Rio Grande do Sul, when the protests started, there were about, I think, 20, 50,000 people on the streets protesting in the capital, which is Porto Alegre, the place where we had the World Social Forum. So Rio Grande do Sul is the state where of which Porto Alegre is the capital. The governor said, okay, so let's listen to the citizens and I need a quick way to listen to them. What was the solution? Let's make a Google Hangout. There were 50,000 people on the streets. How many people do you think attended the Google Hangout? half a million people, 500,000 people went to the Google Hangout with the governor. And in there, one of the things that came out out of that Google Hangout was, well, we need political reform. We want to do a political reform. So he launched, okay, let's do another crowdsourcing. What political reform we want? Then was launched this pairwise system of voting. I can come into technical choices later, but we choose pairwise voting to avoid the lead capture, and I can explain that later on if there are any curiosity about it. So we started asking people uh, who should uh, do political reform. Should it be Congress or should we, be, should we elect a constitutional body separate to do the political reform? Then people voted. And then people could also come up with their ideas. No? So this is, for instance, how it worked. There were also people with kind of iPads on the streets and we would stop citizens and say, which of these two priorities do you prefer? Which do you want, which one do you think it's more important? And people vote on pairwise and we go aggregating these results. Again, the result, more participation. People want to participate more. They want more room to participate. Now, to conclude very quickly, technology can facilitate a lot of these things. But I think we shouldn't forget the uh, Athens, uh, the Athens, let's say, lesson, which is not really about technology. Technology is only an enabler. In the end, it's really about participatory institutions. Thank you very much.
just want to thank you for the very interesting and uh, exciting and clear um, description. It, it, I know it's going to bring about questions later, uh, but it was very helpful, and I think it's useful to start at Athens. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Miguel Perua, e-government lead specialist at the Institutional Capacity of State Division of the Inter-American Development Bank. Prior to being in this position, he was a senior e-government specialist at the Organization of American States, where he managed the organization's e-government portfolio. He was director of government relations for Latin America at the electronic government company GovWorks, where he oversaw various electronic government projects. In Uruguay, he managed projects related to the modernization of the public sector for Spanish government and the United Nations Development Program. He's written several articles, documents, and co-edited a number of books. So let's welcome uh, Miguel. Thank you, uh, Connie, for the kind presentation. And um, actually, I'm happy to see that you and I coordinated without coordinating, Tiago. I think even the colors are the same. Oh. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I have to start by thanking the IRI for the invitation and also congratulating the IRI for uh, putting an emphasis on the importance of uh, ICTs for the socioeconomic progress of Latin America, and in particular to improve the way uh, governments work in the region. I, I, I really uh, um, agree with that approach, and, and I think uh, it's very important for the region. Actually, uh, well, it's also, I'm, I'm very happy to share the stage with, with Tiago and with uh, Mayor Mardoqueo. I had the pleasure to, uh, to be in Patsu myself, and I have to say, out of the 20 years that uh, I've uh, been working in Latin America, what we did in Patsu while I was at the OAS is probably one of the most rewarding experiences that I will take with me forever, because I saw the transformation of Patsun, myself. And uh, it is a great idea to bring Mardoqueo here. When I was uh, preparing to, uh, to speak, I thought, OK, we may be doing something very well here in Washington when we help Latin America, when uh, the mayors in Latin America start coming to teach us and to share with us what they have done. I think that is a great approach, and I'm very happy to be part of it. Uh, I will uh, probably, uh, Tiago chose very well the examples to illustrate what's going on in using technology in the region, because Brazil is really a champion in all those fields that you've, you've chosen, Tiago, and what Brazil has done on e-voting, it, it doesn't have any comparison worldwide, in particular or in, in participatory budgeting and things like that. So I think I'm gonna, probably take us back to some somehow more conceptual uh, elements and some, some practical experiences and try not to get everyone impatient waiting for the rock star, which is Mardoqueo. I'm sorry to be in between you and Mardoqueo. Hopefully I will help with the warm up. And uh, as I'm saying that, I should say hola to the citizens of Patsun that are following us thanks to the technology, right? They are live. Eh, estimados amigos de Patsun, voy a ser breve, no se impacienten, OK? <laughs> um, well, this is what I'm going to talk to you about. Connie, please uh, stop me at any time or give me like a two minute, two minute signal or something like that, because we Latins, when we get the microphone, even, <laughs> even if we don't sing well, we would we, like to use it, actually. Um, this is what I'm going to uh, put on the table, hopefully for a, a, a subsequent discussion after we hear Mardo Keo. A little, bit, a little bit of what's going on uh, and why, why are we talking of what we're talking here. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a review of what smart governance um, 
an initiative in the bank that connect to, to what we are discussing here, and uh, s some specifics of, of what MUNET, that I think it was the, the beginning of, of this beautiful story in, in Patsun, actually. Uh, probably you can't see too much about what is behind there, right? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll review it with you. But um, this is, for those of you that are up to date in technology, this is purposely outdated. This is from Christmas time. Uh, so a long time in technology, right? Like four months. So all those numbers are, in some cases, double. I mean, the number of uh, the 48, 48 hours of video uploaded in YouTube per minute, now is 100 hours. These 2.1 billion people connected, 2.1, now is 2.5. But what, what is relevant of these figures? Uh, this is a transformation that the society is, is going through, I think mostly positive in my view, and this is creating a new type of citizen, the one that Tiago was describing. He was very right about saying this is not about 20 cents, because in fact, most of the citizens back off and say, okay, we will not increase it. People didn't care, they still went to the streets. It was about something else. So. The new citizen behind these numbers is very well informed, probably. Look at the amount of videos and websites and blogs that are uploaded per minute. As a better informed citizen is more demanding. This is very important for the mayors, Mardoqueo. I don't mean to scare you, but the citizens now, as better informed, demand a lot of things. Participation, information, transparency, but it's, it's good to know so you can anticipate and plan. Right? And it is very participatory. There's people from all over the world uploading content, content, informing, sharing, teaching, collaborating. That is what is behind these numbers. Just a couple of examples of what we are talking about. We are talk we're going to talk about participation, transparency, efficiency, uh, mm -hmm. concepts uh, uh, tightly connected to governance. I, I, excuse me for taking, first of all, an example from my own country, from Spain, and second of all, for doing it in Spanish. This is uh, dedicated to you, Mardoqueo, it's in Spanish. Um, look at these numbers, this is impressive. This is the savings, I, 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 I took this, this uh, note from the paper, the savings, uh, actually, it wasn't savings, it was a waste of money of sending one letter, one single letter to all Spaniards to announce the increase in the pension for year 2012. So it's a letter, my mother gets it, that says, dear senora, your pension will increase 2%, so it will be that way. This is $5 million. It's documented, thanks to transparency. Talking about efficiency and savings, multiply that letter for the, I don't know, millions of letters that the government sent, that nowadays could be sent that message uh, uh, somehow else. I do also this image because talking about one of the things that technology is bringing about many things, and for the public sector, it brings, uh, it brings excitement, it brings a reason to rethink uh, the way uh, the government operates. For the society as a journal, it brings uh, friendliness in finding information. It brings even fun in, in looking and, and searching documents. And this is an example. Those of you that have tried to figure out where the government of the US is spending the money and have used this, this tool, this dashboard, it's fantastic. You can even have fun digging into numbers and going from one area to the other. There is no excuse for those that are interested in knowing where the money is going not to use these type of tools. This is an example of a tool that invites to get informed and participate. But those of you that are looking for good examples, we're going to mention some more throughout the journey here today. But if you go to the website of Smart Cities, the upcoming event in Barcelona, this is going to be the fourth edition, all those cities that have been awarded something in this event are really great examples of how ICTs are transforming the relationship between the citizen government and, and the citizens. 
<laughs> but let's go to smart governance, what's uh, the topic of the day. Smart governance, as Tiago was pointing, is more about governance than ICTs, right? What's the, what, what's the pillars of governance? Of governance, What are we talking about here? What is it that we want to uh, support, to, to make, uh, to strengthen, and, and to make uh, more present in the lives of the citizens in Latin America? Transparency, we saw some of the examples of transparency in the budgeting. During my previous job at the OAS, I worked very closely with all directors of government procurement in Latin America and the Caribbean region. Well, nowadays they have no excuse not to use the e-procurement tools that are available for many of them and to make transparent approximately 30% of the budget that goes through their hands. And, and that, that is happening. If you go to the Inter-American Government Procurement Network, you will see how the governments are start, starting to, publi to publish all procurement processes in the governments throughout the region. Participation, uh, I, I think Tiago explained very well how the governments are using technology. You can see examples in the region in cities like uh, Junín in Argentina, Miraflores in Peru, that are engaging the citizens, not just, the, not just in, in budgeting, in, in, in defining regulations, in defining security policies, etc. It's about rule of law. It's, it's about uh, a law that is applied equally to everyone. That's what governance is about. And we're also at the IDB doing an effort to improve the process of designing laws in Latin America and the involvement of citizens in that process. In that regard, actually in this country, the job that is being done by the Sunlight Foundation and, and by the Open Congress uh, project is a reference for the whole region. And in Chile, there is already a foundation that is just bringing in that experience to the region called Ciudadano Inteligente, actually. And it's about efficiency. We saw it in the example I was, I was mentioning about the communication through that traditional means. I mean, the regular letter that costs $5 million as opposed to using an email that costs close to zero, actually. But you can see it coming up in, in many ways. I was reading uh, not long ago that 30% of the traffic in most of the cities is people looking for parking spaces, 30%. I don't know if you have read that article. I mean, it's, it's not, when you think about it, you say, that's true, I'm one of those 30%. I mean, the, all of us that work around here, coming before 6.30, that crazily drive around, right? Well, one of the things that the ICTs are bringing in, in things that they may seem stupid, but are you thinking of all the spend in gas and pollution that 30% of the traffic of any city creates and all the problems? Well, thanks to technology, there is a city testing a, a, an intelligent parking system that will let you know where there is a parking spot, or if there is not, it will tell you, listen, don't drive around crazily. There's nothing here, so it will probably take you five minutes to go somewhere else where there is parking spots. And that will save probably a big portion of that 30% of the traffic. But where does smart nets come from in, in smart governance? The technology or the collective effort? I think what we're witnessing is the engagement of citizens, as Tiago was illustrating very well, in everything that is going on in the general life of any city. I mean, let me put you an example. Uh, in uh, Miraflores, Peru, uh, and as the governments become uh, more tight in the budget and as crisis, the crisis hits in some of the economies, uh, the, the crowd the crowdsourcing or, or the involvement of the citizens in providing uh, services will be just more than just a component of governance. It will be a need, a desperate need. And in, for instance, in Miraflores, Peru, thanks to technology, the citizens engage in providing care and social services for the elderly, something that the municipality couldn't afford. They created an online system to register volunteers uh, through the smartphone to communicate with them who 
was needing support in the municipality and the group of volunteers were taking care of all the elderly in the municipality uh, daily, so saving a lot of resources to the municipality. So it's, it's, it's just, uh, as I mentioned, a question of more the involvement, the engagement, the participation of the citizens than the technology itself. What the technology does is to facilitate that process. But uh, what is the relevant part, and I think Tiago was also pointing to that when, when he mentioned Athens, on the technology side, what is the relevant part? Is data, that is the big word today. I mean, what technology is facilitating is precisely the collection of that data in, in amounts never seen before, the integration, I mean, integration of data from security, environment, transportation, social services, health, etc. Et the integration of that data is what gives power to, uh, to the government managers. The analysis and processing of that data, what is uh, famously known as data mining, and there's a lot of tools being implemented in the region as we speak, particularly at the central level governments, but also in a lot of municipalities. And the sharing. What, what makes uh, the citizens to engage is the sharing of that data, the open data policies that are making available tons of sets of data that in the hands of entrepreneurs and citizens create value for the society. Now, the bad news in the region is what also Tiago mentioned, it, uh, referring to it as a digital divide. What this, this uh, a picture illustrates is which countries are at the top in the world uh, in e-government, e using information and communication technologies to improve the way government works. You will see this is 2012, the latest United Nations ranking, and you will see the usual suspects, right? Korea, the Netherlands, United States is fifth in the latest ranking. But look at this column, this is very relevant. This is the percentage of people that has access to broadband. It's about 30% in, in all of them, I would say. Let me show you what's going on in Latin America, and this is very important. Well, first of all, most of the countries are really lagging behind. Look at the positions in the latest ranking. I mean, the best ones are Uruguay, Colombia, Panama, usually but very few in the top 50, just one, two, below 100. Right. That is a problem. Clearly, Latin America is lagging behind. Right. But look at the explanation in part. Look at the rate of broadband penetration. I mean, average in Latin America, eight point something. That is very important. Everything we are talking about here becomes useless if that rate doesn't grow. Because that means that just a portion of the society has access to many of the things that we described. And, and that is not part of the plan. I mean, the plan is to make it available to every citizen, every citizen in the municipality. So that's a warning sign for those of us that work in this field in the region and really need to be sure that this is taken care of. For the mayors like Mardoqueo, that when they go to the capitals, they have to claim the central government to bring in broadband to their cities, to their cities. I mean, broadband is the water of the 21st century. I mean, most of these mayors fought hard to bring water and sewage to their cities in the 20th century. They did a very good job. In the 21st century, they're gonna have to fight to bring broadband to the municipalities. Just a brief mention to an initiative that connects to this one uh, at the IDB is the Emerging and Sustainable Cities Initiative that is working currently with 25 uh, cities in, in the region. And as you probably know, 80%, already 2% of the citizens in um, Latin America live in a city. And that's a growing trend. I mean, there's, the, there's cities that are really being crowded. And that creates a lot of challenges, particularly in sustainability from an environmental perspective, a financial perspective, a security perspective, etc. This initiative is helping those cities that are growing fast to manage their futures in sustainability. That website has 
abundant information of the job we're doing with those 25. The plan is to incorporate uh, 25 more in the upcoming years. And this is MUNET, uh, my uh, final slide, uh, which is, I think, part of what is taking us here because uh, what, that, what started the story of, of Patsun is, is MUNET. I remember in 2006, the first workshop with, with the mayor of, of Patsun. And this is what I think the, the, the lessons learned that I, I, uh, I, I would extract from the experience we had with MUNET in, in more than 100 municipalities in the region. And, uh, and, and again, I emphasize my, my happiness to see IRI playing a big role in this field because that, this, this can be of great help to many municipalities in Central America. Uh, there's two, two key elements of success. One is the comprehensive approach. Uh, and by that I mean you have the political buy-in, the mayor leading, that, that happened in Munet from the beginning the needs assessment to find out what is it that the city needs. We didn't figure that out in Washington. We just went there and said, what, what is it that you need in the municipality? What is it that you need to improve? And UNED has uh, a lot of diagnosis that it does before it starts working. It's locally led. We didn't want to do it with consultants from outside. We just train a team in the municipality. Well, Jorge Lopez Bachier is here, and he was leading the effort locally in, in, in Patsun. It is planned. I mean, it's, it's just not doing something uh, fun to impress anyone. It's just to think along with the locals, what is it that they want to do with the city uh, looking at the future and, and take the time to do planning before we start doing websites. That, that's, that's what we did with, with uh, Patsun. It was guided. Yes, they do it, but they need the outside support. We brought in uh, consultants that were working side by side, but led by the locals. And the flexibility with technology, again, going to the message from uh, Tiago, that the technology was not important here. Uh, Munet let them use whatever technology they preferred, and if they use the one offered by the program, the program released the source code and everything, so they take full ownership of, of that technology. And the knowledge transfer. Uh, the program set up an office in Guatemala, managed by Guatemalans. I think that was a key element of UNED that made it successful in, in Guatemala in general. And that was what I had to share with you. Thank you for the attention. And now the rock star comes. <laughs> thank you very much. And, and particularly, thank you for highlighting what we all need to think about, which is the challenges. It's very exciting, but we have to be honest with ourselves that not everyone has access, and that's a, uh, that's a challenge for all of us, and just appreciate your, your highlighting that. But you want to take a moment before we bring the rock star up so that those who need uh, the uh, translation can, put, can hook themselves up? Uh, two minutes. Okay. Uh, okay. Channel 5, uh, for those of you who are interested in the English, it's Channel 5. Spanish is one. So, so it was really only two minutes we were to use it. <laughs> it gives me, it gives me great, it gives me great pleasure, great pleasure, 
to um, introduce the, uh, the mayor, and as he's been labeled several times, the rock star, the mayor of Patsoon, Guatemala. And he's been the mayor there uh, since 2012, uh, Mayor Konkash. He's a proponent of effective democratic governance and citizen engagement. As the mayor, he has been working to bridge the gap between his government and his constituency by using the municipality's limited resources to develop innovative ways to incorporate low-cost, high-impact information and communication technologies into his governing strategies. He took the initiative to provide free Wi-Fi in the town square. Just imagine that. <laughs> the free Wi-Fi in the town square open a digital community center for residents and actively educates regional municipal leaders on the benefits of ICT and how they can be used to constructively communicate with citizens. The mayor also serves as vice president of the Guatemalan Association of Mayors and Indigenous Authorities. So with that, I would like to uh, bring uh, forward um, the mayor and uh, ask him to uh, share with us his, his views, his ideas, and I know it will spark a great conversation. It is uh, an extreme pleasure to uh, greet you at this moment and to thank you to Iris for this uh, space to um, uh, share our uh, experiences with the municipality of Patsum. I also, uh, without any doubt, uh, uh, you're uh, in the municipality. They're waiting for me. I'm sending them a greeting to the uh, council, municipality, my working group, uh, who are holding hands with this government. 2012, 2016, we have a lot of expectation, a lot of challenges uh, with this municipality. I would like to uh, uh, say hi and in the name of the Patsun community and to share in this occasion the experiences that we have lived uh, and definitely to have positive results during this uh, period, which in reality the uh, population uh, trust and that's why we're uh, facing and we're doing uh, efficiency and transparency and all the things that we do. I would like to show you some of the uh, references of the municipality so that you can get an idea as to uh, the population, the activities, uh, economic activities, etc. Patsun is located at 83 kilometers of the city of Guatemala, the capital. We can say it will take an hour and 30 minutes. And we're uh, very close, uh, relatively close. The population, it's a uh, form of We have a population of 54,000 inhabitants, and the urban area is 27,000, and 27,000 in the rural areas. 94% uh, of the uh, population speaks the Kachikil uh, language. In my case, I can speak it, will say, uh, such as I can prove it today, I am very happy. The activities, the economics activities, is um, agricultural. Uh, it, it is identified with uh, the um, exportation of corn that is uh, imported here, uh, and 40% to Europe, and that uh, provides the uh, the broccoli product, 80% in Europe and 20% here to the United States. The 
the program, uh, MUNED, was uh, started in 2005, and we also found the great uh, benefits, and we also uh, appreciate that great uh, support that have been provided to us during this process, and we have taken the advantage to uh, provide the transparency to the municipal government. The population uh, uh, insists definitely that the resources sh should be used in a way so that they could be uh, transparent. And I had said it many times that it can be done, and we could set up an example. You leave me a sign check, but we do not fill out. So the population uh, worries, and they're interested in what is going to happen with that check, and they cannot just leave it blank. The population had the facility, the fiscalization, to uh, be able to see as to how we can uh, invest this resource. Therefore, in, in a way that uh, we take advantage of this uh, uh, technological uh, uh, process and space so that it could uh, provide us in regards of EDs and other institutions that it can straighten this, uh, this theme. Uh, my uh, responsibility uh, uh, it comes about on the point that we want to work for at least four years for Patsun, but uh, I, I came with my uh, uh, forehead uh, up and I want to leave like that, but uh, there exists the uh, um, responsibility uh, on the part of the municipal uh, council that uh, we have a person in charge of the, he is the intermediate of the um, workforce that we have uh, for the council of the municipality. And this is what we have as a very strong uh, item in our municipality. The work that we are doing is uh, we don't want to risk. And because of that, we want to institutionalize so that we have the warranty and also to uh, emphasize that the government, the central government has the intention, but we don't have the, uh, the support from them. If uh, Patsun has uh, gone ahead, we want to guarantee, and this is not a definite uh, time, but this is, uh, should be for a long time, and this is uh, the, the uh, institutionalization uh, application that we have. This is uh, a strong, uh, the, the strong emphasis of this is not uh, very costly. We have the tools that practically we see from the, the all the benefits that we are receiving uh, with a very, very low cost. The modernization of the municipality uh, we have in reception uh, where the uh, neighborhood uh, comes uh, with the uh, mayor, but we have a long line, and that line, uh, while they are waiting their um, their chance to to be uh, seen, they can see, they can use the computer, and uh, they can do their uh, direct consultation through the computer. We also have a computer in the uh, library where the children, when they come to their consultation, they can access a computer and uh, they can uh, go with uh, uh, a lot of uh, information and very satisfied. The connectivity, definitely, uh, we have been uh, investing uh, so now we have in the municipality that benefit that each uh, worker has the communication from one uh, computer that in Guatemala it's not common, but in the municipality we have that contact from the uh, uh, mayor to George to, uh, to, the, uh, to different offices of uh, the treasury or secretariat and with with a click, we can uh, tra translate, uh, the, send the information. Our web page 
es patsun.gov.gt It, and you can go there and uh, get a lot of conclusions. Uh, the uh, YouTube uh, uh, site and Picasa as well. And uh, we have been uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, videos and uh, pictures in there. Some of uh, the things that I want to emphasize is that this page This information uh, has not been politicized. Uh, let me tell you that uh, personally, I would like to, to be in the, uh, uh, I have been in the community, uh, in the, uh, the orange color. You will not find that, that this color is uh, uh, emphasized here. This is not uh, for the, uh, um, uh, This is not personal, but it's uh, for the community. And in this case, I have been very careful. The center, oh, uh, the, the digital center, uh, this uh, uh, tele center, we have been initiated and we have been benefited many persons, uh, like teachers and community leaders who have uh, come to, uh, to take some courses and it is a lot of benefit for them. We, I like to say that uh, in the case of uh, some community leaders, uh, because of luck, have had to leave their community because of uh, scholarships in, uh, in other countries. Um, because of technology, they have uh, given a follow-up to their own uh, projects, and we are pleased with that because those tools have been, uh, uh, and have enabled them to give a follow-up to their projects. We have, uh, we have already uh, heard that in the uh, internet, wireless internet in the uh, park uh, has had an impact uh, uh, for youth and they have uh, uh, allowed the youth uh, to uh, complete their their work, their homework from uh, school or university, and it is at the front of the municipality, and we have the opportunity to see them to do their homework or to do research uh, uh, about their country, their culture, and other things. Uh, with respect to the uh, Facebook page, uh, I sincerely uh, want to say that uh, we have uh, had a year of uh, being there, and uh, any of the uh, um, uh, mayors uh, uh, thinking about uh, a web page, uh, it's very scary, but uh, if the things have been uh, transparent, let's uh, remove the curtains and uh, let's uh, uh, let's allow the uh, the glass to see what we are doing uh, and uh, what is it that they are um, what is it that he is being paid how much is he is um, being uh, benefiting from that benefited from uh, his uh, position to have that interchange with the uh, the citizens and the modernization. It is not a common thing in Guatemala, but it's the opportunity for them to have a process, uh, a, a slow process, but they, they can be introduced into this program at, at the low cost without having to get go into the uh, municipality, but uh, now it is being practiced. With respect to the Facebook, We have had this experience. At the beginning, there had been disadvantages uh, in the sense that many people, uh, some uh, uh, oppose, from opposing uh, parties, uh, wanted to go, uh, boycott the uh, the activities of the. Uh, uh, of the uh, of our activities and uh, when they saw that uh, we are not uh, doing uh, what they are saying they become our followers for example An example, last year uh, we um, acquired a, um, a park that has been abandoned, uh, uh, World Heritage, it was deteriorated, awful. We took the decision to take the city council and we said that we were going to invest 
uh, around $50,000. And when we presented the project, we uh, uploaded it to Facebook, uh, the proposal as to how this project was going to uh, uh, end up, and then they started questioning us. They told us, Mayor, that park is not the way th that it is, and we need uh, more information as to how much it will be the investment, and they would tell us it would be 2,000 quetzales. I would say it would be around $800,000. But another person would say, no, this would be a 1 million uh, quetzal investment. Another one would say, would say half a million. I uploaded the information and I told them, look, it would be 325,000 quetzales, which is less than $50,000. When they recognize this information in the park, uh, turn out uh, beautiful. And nowadays, those persons that attacked us, now they're telling us, Mayor, it was a great project. I congratulate you. That's how we want how our mayor to work. And therefore, that's why we have nothing to hide from the population. And instead, to take advantage of this tool um, for uh, all the uh, benefits that it has, but not all mayors will have the uh, guts to uh, do this, but it will depend on the projection. It would uh, depend on the focus of the persons of the project, and we're committed to that project to the community. Also, we have made some changes in the municipality, the computers, the licensing, and nowadays we have uh, in, in coordination that we have uh, uh, spoke to uh, Jorge, the advisor, and the working group, and we are also uh, being protected in that sense because we needed, we, we looked at it as a necessity that was very important. All of the information that you can find it is uh, created on creative.com, um, Creative Commons, and in this case, we appreciate the uh, space, the all of this information that have been shared, and we have made it uh, throughout these uh, spaces. Here is where I would like to uh, uh, pause and to show you some of the uh, points, uh, very specific points. I was saying that the page, as you can see, there is no orange color there that you can notice. Uh, and, and that's how you associate the municipality with that color. And that's the importance of the municipality of Katsu. What is the emphasis here? The emphasis here is the culture, the costumes. And it, it, it makes an emphasis on the activities that are realized uh, within our community. And in that sense, that's why they have uh, uh, taken advantage of they have taken over this particular space. In many occasions, when we upload any information, such as the inauguration of a uh, mayor's project, then I try to tell the uh, working group that not to make an emphasis or, or make uh, a point in, in using that color that I spoke to you about. And here we can see, for example, uh, there is a, a, on a tab, a kachikel, that we don't want to lose that culture in Katsum. We want to strengthen it, and as I explained, to you, we, we speak Kachikel, but we cannot write it. Uh, just uh, a few people can uh, uh, write or read Kachikel. It's a bit complicated when you read it. Here we have the translation, and many of the people that want to access it, uh, there is a, a, a translation in Kachikel. We also find uh, more of the information in regards to the municipality, how many munis mun uh, munis municipalities, how many inhabitants, the urban, uh, what is it uh, um, uh, concentrated on, how many cantones, how many colonies. And we also find um, Unigram of the uh, uh, working group uh, uh, within the municipality there. You can find all the details, uh, including, as I explained to you, let me tell you something, that it can not be found in other 
municipalities, the mayor's uh, salary. The salary, the, uh, the, uh, the salary, uh, the, uh, the diet of the um, representative in the country, and you can find that here there is doubt also that is created when the mayor, how much is the mayor uh, uh, has, the, the, the mayor has like a high salary, and here that's when they can, it, it will erase their, their doubts, especially the uh, patroneros. Also, another important matter that we want to make an emphasis on is that all the acts, all the sessions uh, for the uh, council, here you can see it. We have it. We have it, we have separated by themes. Uh, supposedly, the auxiliary uh, mayors, uh, whom we call the community leaders, and there's also the uh, president, Kokov, which is the community of development. And if you want to um, uh, continue um, and then verify uh, their um, programs, if they want to include their um, uh, request after a month or two months, you can see whether their project was approved or not approved. Uh, therefore, uh, it's separated by themes, every in single, each act. I don't think today we have the opportunity to see many of them, but if one of you would like to see the education uh, program, look under education, and it will tell you how many acts uh, uh, talked about education during the year. If you want to see uh, the theme of the um, the environment, the same way, it is separated by themes. And it, we consider that it's one of the strengthening that the municipality of Pitsun has created through technology and through these tools. Also, you can see the videos lo uh, uploaded in YouTube, especially the, the, the ones that are visited the most is the ones that are here, is Paisanos Nuestros, our uh, uh, pop population that's located here in the United States. And obviously, uh, there's a lot of nostalgia, nostalgia, nostalgia in regards to when they see um, the market day uh, in, in Patsun, and it's one of the most uploaded uh, uh, pages, and they identify themselves, and they also include their uh, their commentaries, some of them uh, write me and they uh, tell me and they let me know that some of the videos are very nice and that it remembers, they re they remember that and they want to come back to Guatemala because of Katsum. We also have the videos that are uh, 1,012 videos that we uh, have uh, in uh, presently. We have uh, uh, made a, um, a study in Patsun uh, nowadays has a record, a very important record in regards to uh, uploaded videos on YouTube. Can we see that? Can we present that, please? So that is part of the video that is uh, 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 something that we have with the neighbors in the um, uh, in Patsun so that they can uh, participate more. We also have some pictures. Uh, it's a, an important collection in which uh, practically we have of, of all the times we have some black and white that uh, they are going to be preserved and it won't 
it is not uh, equally in the uh, phys uh, physical uh, pictures. Uh, we have been uh, uh, storing them here. And uh, we also have some uh, traditional pictures, uh, Corpus Christi, which is a strong uh, tradition. What is the, uh, uh, the 20th uh, of May uh, fair? We have a collection of, uh, of uh, albums there. The uh, Facebook page, as we have mentioned, uh, we have uh, given a lot of uh, space for youth and uh, neighbors uh, and uh, avoid the inversion, the, the, the investment uh, of having to go to the uh, uh, counselors with the uh, uh, leaders uh, in the uh, city. But we have given them here a chance to express what they need. And uh, if they express something, we have uh, immediately uh, a, a chance to respond. And uh, we have a, a, a necessity that uh, can be resolved in a, in a, in a more adequate uh, way, and we have uh, advantage of the technology. We have the Pinterest uh, account uh, with a lot of uh, pictures. E each of these albums are uh, selected by theme. And we have uh, some pictures of the uh, cemetery, of the uh, uh, tombstones. Uh, we had uh, some worry about uh, this. Uh, and uh, then we had a lot of uh, feedback because people started to see that it, there was bit, uh, pictures of their the tombstones of their family members. And this is good for the community. We also have what we mentioned, the service of uh, the uh, Wi-Fi. This is the uh, regional uh, uh, clothing of uh, the ladies. Uh, and, uh, and they have a laptop with a telephone connected in the park. And uh, one of the themes that are, is very important uh, is the conferences with the uh, uh, migrants of uh, uh, the Skype uh, communication, and uh, there is a um, uh, there's, there are comments about uh, people who have not seen uh, their uh, grandchildren for seven or eight years. They have the chance to see them in a screen, and this has given them a great result. And uh, the the person in charge of this uh, center uh, says that these people have cried uh, to see their children out of uh, the country. And this is uh, something that is very impactful and has given um, a, a lot more to the uh, neighbors. I want to thank uh, the Institute for this space that you have uh, opened to us. It's a conference that uh, we uh, shared in uh, El Salvador, and we have uh, and we have done it so that other people take uh, advantage of this and uh, take it as a role model. Uh, we want to share that uh, in this concurso. Uh, in, in Guatemala and Honduras, uh, in this uh, competition, we were uh, the winners. Uh, and we were very happy of uh, the job that we have been doing. And this picture has been uh, um, published in the uh, uh, media in Guatemala. We have uh, shared experiences with other uh, mayors. Uh, as you see here uh, in Emetra, uh, with whom we have an uh, opportunity to share experiences. And we have had uh, other workshops and emphasized at the, lev at the department level uh, in Chimaltenango, which it, it has 16 uh, municipalities. And every time that we have a workshop, for the directors of the uh, of the uh, of all the leaders, uh, let's say let's go to Patsun because they, they there is a a, um, a telecenter and. Uh, 
it means that we are ahead of the other municipalities and uh, we have other activities in Guatemala, uh, the, the capital, in El Salvador, and other uh, workshops celebrated in um, Patsun. We have had many experiences. I want to congratulate uh, Ivory uh, Iri uh, for this space. And we have our own initiatives. You come and uh, you uh, support us. It is not uh, an imposed uh, uh, thing that uh, you have allowed us to to have the freedom to to develop ourselves and to have different uh, um, experiences, and we have uh, uh, engaged in these themes uh, thanks to your support. A naming of the uh, commission of uh, the peak in, uh, in our po population, in our uh, municipality has helped us. This is an, um, a very important step that the commission uh, should have the, um, uh, their, uh, their tools and otherwise it would uh, get lost. Also, the uh, interchange of experiences, we have uh, uh, given some experiences, but we also want some ideas. We have, uh, we are, we have flexibility to strengthen our theme, and uh, the paperwork uh, that needs to be done uh, in, in, with respect to these tools, we need to, uh, to have that vision. We, to, to use the resources and uh, to allow the uh, population so that they can uh, participate in this governance uh, and uh, Patsun has been doing it in this way. The also transparency we have uh, presented uh, before the uh, population twice a year and uh, they come uh, to our meetings where we uh, call the uh, um, mayors, uh, assistants, and all uh, leaders. And uh, we have uh, uh, we we tell them what we have been using the money uh, that we have um, uh, had uh, from the uh, government, the central government, as well as from all other resources. Uh, the uh, inviting the participation of the the citizens. population, the citizens, uh, they are considering that we have had that as an um, a success, and I hope that these uh, our successes uh, can serve uh, to others so that you can uh, get to know us better. I certainly want to thank, uh, thank the mayor. Um, I want to acknowledge that uh, there are people from uh, Patsun uh, watching, uh, so your constituents uh, know what you're saying here, and 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 I'm sure they're proud. Uh, I think we can all understand um, why he was elected mayor, and you may have some campaign workers here uh, to help you on your next campaign because of the impressive way in which you are establishing a, a transparent government where there is real. Uh, participation on the part of the public. We're now going to spend the balance of the time in uh, question and answer. I not only want to acknowledge that we have uh, people uh, viewing in uh, from Guatemala, but from other parts of Latin America, and we welcome them. We welcome all of you who are here. Um, in the question and answer, if you wouldn't mind um, saying your uh, name, uh, if you are associated with an organization, the organization, and if you want to direct the question to a particular participant, do so, otherwise uh, it'll be open season. So we have um, microphones that uh, will travel around the room. Please raise your hand and indicate uh, if and when uh, you have a question or a comment. I discourage speeches. We have had 
the speeches that we arranged for. <laughs> we don't need more. <laughs> okay. So please, uh, questions. I'll go here first. No, you, okay. Heritage. Right. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ray Walser with the Heritage Foundation, and I'll, I'll direct this one to Tiago and Miguel. You know, this is, this is very useful to see what is, that there are other people engaged in participatory democracy other than those who sort of follow the Bolivarian line, and this is, I think, should be eye-opening to many people. How would you compare, have you studied sort of the Venezuelan model compared to, say, what's going on in Brazil or the other sort of work? Is there any substantial difference, or how would you sort of classify uh, participatory democracy in, in these both sort of models that exist? I mean, I haven't studied it, but I read something about it a little while ago. <laughs> so, uh, no, well, one of the things is that from, from what I understand, and I can be totally wrong, so take this with a grain of salt and pepper, uh, um, is that in Venezuela, much of the participation is mediated by existing mobilizing, mobilization traditional social movements and so on, which is which is great. No? What what we see for instance in the Brazilian case and many of these practices is that there there is an interface with social society, but the social society has a strong uh, component as a mobilizer, but not as a mediator. So uh, I would say but that's kind of like overall hint, is that the, the, the difference in some cases, and particularly with these ones that we see on technology, you start to have a more disintermediation of the participation. Now, because if you think the development world particularly, and I'm, now I'm part of it, we think of participation normally, we think engaged. We're saying you engage citizens, we actually engage CSOs. No? And these models are disintermediated. Yes. Briefly, uh, actually, I didn't uh, study it either, but um, I've uh, been touring those countries for 20 years, so, and I've seen myself, even prior to the arrival of the knowledge-based society, the culture of participation in those Bolivarian countries. I mean, I, I, it was always, always shocking for me to go through the streets of Bolivia, I mean, even 15 years ago, and see gatherings of citizens at every corner discussing public matters, and a little bit less so in, in Ecuador, and, and somehow less so in, in Venezuela. So there is a culture of participation there in those countries, a strong one, and, and it, it it is becoming law even. I mean, if you review the, con the new constitution of, of Bolivia, I mean, it's just, it, I think it, it is almost mandatory participation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it's just this trend of, of uh, kind of participatory democracy, ra democracy rather than representative democracy that is a strong debate in, in the region. But paradoxically, those countries, in my view, or in, in my experience in the region, have not taken advantage of ICTs to strengthen that culture if, if that is what, what they strongly believe in, right? So uh, if, if you look at just my basic table about how they are doing and the government rankings or in bringing in technology to everyone to just facilitate that strong culture, it is not happening in, in the Bolivarian countries. So I guess there is a window of opportunity for them to strengthen that culture that, that is pretty much on the streets uh, taking advantage of ICTs. But I, I didn't do a formal comparison, actually. Next, next question. There were several hands. Uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> Steve. Uh, Steve Johnson, uh, IRI. Uh, this question is for the mayor of Patsun. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for coming here today and sharing uh, your knowledge and what you've done in your community. Kind of curious as to what uh, means people have of access, accessing the internet. Uh, what is the primary device uh, that people use to be able to access the internet and your website and download all of the different uh, government forms that they need for the conduct of their uh, civic life. Mm. 
Bueno. Sí, muy, muy importante. Sí, es muy importante. Tenemos que reconocer que en Guatemala, we take, uh, we will say it as one uh, a step backward in, re in, re regard in regards to the acquisitions of uh, what we see is like uh, tabletop computers. Uh, they, they're able to connect to the municipality. We also have the laptops. Uh, the, the young younger generation have the opportunity. They go to the park or through um, uh, cyber cafes, uh, services. Uh, cyber cafes uh, in, in, in every block. And also, I would like to make an emphasis that, but soon we can say that we can count that we have 16 to 20 uh, cyber cafes. Uh, we have not compared it to other municipalities, but myself, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we had no signal to connect us. And, uh, and I went to search at other municipalities so that I can find that space. And it was not very easy to find it in another town. The difference that we have in Patsun is the means. And uh, some of us have the uh, economic possibility to uh, have other uh, um, computers. But in reality, uh, uh, there are um, many uh, few cases that have that opportunity to uh, connect. Hi, uh, Julio Rank from the National Endowment for Democracy. I had Two very brief questions for uh, Tiago and, and Miel. The first is, um, you alluded to it a little bit, but if there is a role for organized civil society in pushing for these policy changes at the national level. And then the second is, if you could briefly talk about the failed experiences in the use of ICTs, so that, you know, that we that are acting as funders or as interested in the matter can look out for certain things that simply don't work or that haven't worked in the past. Uh, thank you, Julio. Actually, <clears throat> let me start by the last one. Uh, uh, all of us that, that work in, in what we work, basically, in just, just helping others in, in any field to progress, uh, know that it's very hard to document failed experiences. You probably had the same problem, right? It is very difficult to go to a major and say, Major, come over here and share all the failures of the last three years. <laughs> If, if you find a way to do it, I, I have the resources because I've been uh, prosecuted by several funders to say we need to document that. And I told them, yeah, sure, I know we need. I mean, I can have that exchange on a one-to-one -one with the mayor of the minister, but he's not going to let me publicize that. But, but having said that, let, let me mention two of them, and I probably do not ref need to mention the country. <clears throat> One of the pioneer countries in ICTs in the region in the beginning of the, in, of the 2000s, after investing a lot of resources in putting online e-government services, they were very disappointed with the results, with the level of usage. They found out that people just didn't know what was available. I mean, they invested a lot of resources in putting things online, but they did not invest in communication. And, and it was a huge failure. So much so that I would say that country never recovered from that failure. I'm still look, waiting for them to come back and be uh, at the forefront. A second one, it relates to municipalities, uh, and it's another country of the region that has done a lot of things so well. In my view, it has the best digital strategy in the region right now. And in with regards to municipalities, they thought that just uh, what they call uh, regional connectivity plan or something like that, that has connectivity and some telecenters and and some university students going from city to, to city to support was good enough to bring in e-government to those municipalities. And it was a big failure for the, just, uh, for, for, for the frustration of the minister, because I had this conversation with him, and for the frustration of the mayors that are still waiting to get support from the central government to get serious about incorporating ICTs in the way Mardokeo described right now. So that's another failure, which is not to put all the pieces in place. And when I put that slice about MUNET, 
it was really based on years of experience and seeing that if you do not have if you do not have all the pieces of the puzzle in place, most probably you will not get the results. You may get the support of the mayor, but if you don't have the strategy, something is not going to work. And if you have the mayor and the strategy and the local team, but you don't take care of the appropriate technology and, and the flexibility and the adaptability and the transfer that I described and those open source things, you may fail too. So those are kind of the two, the two failures I can share. Uh, but it's hard to find, actually. Uh, <clears throat> as per the capacity of the citizens to uh, affect policies and to probably mobilize governments, I, I think there's a lot of capacity. Uh, Tiago described it very well. Uh, and, and throughout the region, uh, I would say the ones that have the stronger capacity, I don't know if Mardoqueo will agree with me, are the mayors. I mean, it's, it's mayor's time, in my view, in the region, not just because there is a big decentralization debate in most of the countries. And if they work more together and they forget a little bit about the color, uh, about the orange or the blue or whatever, and they go together to the central government, uh, they have a lot of capacity to affect policies, and that, that, that's what I'm seeing. But definitively, there is, there is a lot of room for, for citizens also to, to affect policies in this field, in, in nice cities. And they should be doing that, because the message I, I brought into the table with that, with that, uh, with that table, that Excel, on, on the low level of broadband connectivity, in my view, is, is worrisome. And I'm happy to, to, to share that the U.S. government has a broadband initiative for the region, as does the IDB. But I need as many as we can find, because it, it is really, as, as we speak, Korea has a plan to bring in 100 megabytes to every Korean by 2015, so around the corner. Yes, in fact. Can I just ask very oh, quickly oh, to I that? See, yeah, sorry. yeah. No, just on the on the civil society, if understood well. What's their role in pushing for reforms? No, towards participation. Maybe my experience is that sometimes it's essential, but sometimes civil society doesn't want competition. If they already have access to governments, why would they be asking for more participation? So, let's not fool ourselves with an idea of civil society as a barrier of democratic ideals. Full stop. No, so. Depends on the, it's a, it's a case by case, no? On a bad uh, success history, I remember I was do, looking at state legislatures in, in Brazil. I won't tell the name of state legislature and I was doing research. And I was looking how they used IT to do lawmaking process. So I went to this very clientelistic place where actually members of, of the legislature, they would pay for medical examinations in exchange for for votes, basically, you know? But, uh, so basically, the state legislature, they have no IT system at all. And what's shocking, so first is law for seat belts, they had like 30 different laws, because they didn't even have a system to check if there was legislation already on that subject or not. But they had a very sophisticated thing, because on clientelistic relationships, what happens is, if the client, which is the citizen, starts to free ride, you lose. Basically, is if I ask for you for a consultation, but I ask for you for money, me as a as a member of parliament, I'm, I lose the condition to buy your vote. So there was this state legislature in Brazil that actually they had a system that if you come and you ask a favor for me, then if you go to the others, there's like a system that goes blinking so that he says, no, you're already owing for that guy. So all that I'm gonna say is that technology will will not change institutions, it will mirror the institutions that it have, for good and for bad. Thank you. All the way in the back, and then I'll come this way. Yes. Eh, hola, mi nombre es Viviana Yacaman. Eh, yo dirijo eh, el Departamento de América Latina de Freedom House. Eh, mi pregunta es para el alcalde. Bueno, primero decir, pedir disculpas porque llegué muy tarde, no pude llegar antes, desafortunadamente. Eh, pero me pareció súper interesante lo que vi, me pareció que es el resultado del trabajo de mucha gente eh, unida, trabajando en conjunto, que es muy innovador y que además muestra un gran compromiso, entonces lo quería felicitar por eso. Y la pregunta tiene que ver con sacarlo un poco del tema de, de esta reunión, que tiene que ver con la tecnología, y es preguntarle cómo 
integrar eh, lo online con lo offline. Eh, nosotros hemos visto que muchas veces es necesario hacer esa, ese proceso de transición o esa integración para poder hacer más efectivo los, eh, las herramientas online. Y me pregunto qué estrategias han usado, si han tenido que usarlas, si las han pensado, etc. Uh, first of all, thank you, Vivian. Right. First of all, uh, we are in the transitional process. We have detected that in the municipality of Patsum, the, the young people are the ones that are using these tools, the technological tools. Uh, if we see uh, statistically, uh, we could say 10 to 15 percent of the adults, uh, we could say between 40, 50 years plus and over. And most of the ones that use it, uh, 70 to 70, 80%, it would be the uh, uh, teenagers who are uh, interested uh, in acquiring this information. During this process, what we have done is that we have been practicing both. We, it, it is a process that obviously uh, it's a long process so that we can uh, continue doing the change and we can definitely uh, acquire the technology. In the past, the practice was uh, to open uh, uh, convocation, general convocations of the population. The mayor would come and physically will present the uh, proposal, the information, uh, whatever has been uh, invested and in in what it's going to be invested. And this is an anecdote uh, from a, a, a mayor for a few periods behind that he would inform that uh, an ex uh, particular place, a project was executed, it was invested, uh, the amount of $10,000, let's say. The population was there, and somebody would raise their hands and would say, no, that's not true because I'm from that place, and that didn't happen. The experience is that when when you count, definitely, is the fiscalization of the social fiscalization that the, the population uh, do make. Uh, in this case, uh, a combination of both uh, uh, math themes is that we have realized uh, we uh, uh, help uh, the uh, uh, assistant mayors uh, so that it will provide, uh, we, 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 um, pre we meet and together and we create uh, slides and we also provide copies of all the uh, investment that have been done so that they can share the information with their communities and the sectors uh, which they belong to so that the information can reach them and, and the other side this tool for which the, the one we have presented we are taking uh, the two matters simultaneously, simultaneously so that we can uh, uh, face the uh, challenges in this case but that's in reality, a transition that I will believe it will take a few years. Uh, thank you. I, I promise, I have to follow through on my promise. I promise back here, striped, uh, Thank you very much. Maroon. <laughs> uh, my name is Justin Costlin. I work at Google Ideas. My question is for the panel. Um, so we've heard today about a, a few technology-enabled models that seem to be working, which is fantastic. And so if you could have anything uh, in the world to juice the adoption, spread, scale these models, what, what do you think could most take something that's working and really apply it very broadly? Well, I, I would start. Uh one thing is to add technology to existing processes. Another thing is to create processes and add technology to it. So basically just to say, that's why I chose to work in my team and, and the team that I work for uh, uh, to, um, to work with participatory budgeting. It's because nowadays there are 2,500 uh, institutions that are, are ready to absorb technology instead of like starting a process from zero to engage citizens and everything. So we prefer to leverage. How do I try to leverage instead of going from zero? 
That's a very good question. Thank you so much. And I'm happy that it comes from Google that has a lot of capacity to, to, to help in, in these type of causes. The, I think the recipe is, is uh, out there, and, and this is an experience that, in my view, is very replicable. We, you, you ask the right question. I think it could be spread throughout Latin America, and there is 16,000 municipalities in Latin America. I mean, we're very lucky that we held maybe 100 or 200, and we should celebrate, but we should be thinking along the lines of what you are thinking. And uh, if we can replicate the model, what we did with Patsun, we, we cannot probably reproduce the mind of Maradokeo or the previous mayor, that, that we cannot. But the rest of the things we can do. We should grow initiatives like MUNED or the one the IRI is leading in the region and scale them up. And if we gather mayors like Maradokeo in rooms like this one with a serious plan, the investment is ridiculously low. I mean, MUNED has cost the OES and the government of Canada in the last seven years less than a million dollars in the last seven years. And it has worked with 150 municipalities, and it has changed lives in many of those municipalities. Because Mardoqueo didn't have time to elaborate, but I was there. I, I saw the transformation, and I saw what they're doing in, in that telecenter and all that. So the answer is this is replicable. It can be done, I would say, without too much difficulty and without too much investment. It's just uh, following the model and gathering around places like this, mayors like Mardoqueo, that are the best example and, and message conveyors for, for other mayors. I'm gonna ask you, oh yes, Mayor, Here. yes. Sí, en el caso particular relacionado con la pregunta, pues yo veo la necesidad case with the central government that we have a specific uh, section um, that we can for um, strengthen these themes with George uh, Jorge the last year um, we were in Colombia and how this is uh, this is different uh, when the uh, government is uh, trying to go, uh, to help and to initiate uh, to it is a complicated issue in with the part of uh, the uh, uh, the centers uh, because uh, I hope that uh, Guatemala would do the same because this can be helped so that we can uh, reach our goal. The government, uh, the president, uh, with his ministers, uh, can um, uh, can uh, take charge of uh, strengthening. Uh, and uh, this should be an initiative uh, of the president in case of the municipalities that who want to do an efficient work. It is uh, very important that uh, the um, government participates. I, 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 we have time for two more questions, and I want to end here because I want everybody to leave too. So, I mean, Rashida, Patricia, I'm going to end here because I want Ms. Prosser Sterling, I'm from Oracle Corporation. Uh, Alcalde, muchas gracias y felicidades por todo lo que ha hecho. Um, my question has to do mostly with the regulatory environment. Uh, certainly, as a municipality, uh, you have uh, made, made your own city an example, a regional example. Are there things, and of course, as a municipality, uh, you are in a country, and that country has regulatory policies. Are there regulatory policies in terms of telecom, uh, the use of the internet, uh, cross-border data flows, uh, local content requirements that may in fact compromise what your further wishes for you, your municipality might be?
Based on the experience, uh, definitely uh, there is no inconvenience. Uh, we have been publishing all the information, and I consider that um, we are going through a good uh, uh, way, uh, reaching our objectives, and we don't have any objective. Yeah, mayor, from one of your citizens using Twitter. <laughs> yeah, so there. <laughs> and the question, the question is, how has your perception of social networking changed during your tenure in office? Personally, we have seen that the technology is part of life, not as a, as an individual, but also as a, a person that are innovative. There has not been any strong change, but more or less, I have learned how to utilize these uh, tools. So the answer to our friend, to this uh, uh, countryman, my personal case, I have uh, um, dedicated myself in, in matters of exportation, and for this, you had to have at least two, three computers and to have that link with your clients here in the United States. And now we have that opportunity to show the ability, the experience that we have gained so that that we could focus on a, a munici uh, municipal theme. In this case, we are convinced that the technology have uh, helped us so that we can uh, uh, reach the objectives that we had uh, proposed. And, and what better place that Patsun can show to the world uh, with the use of this uh, technology? Yes, last question. Everybody needs to meet you anyway. So introduce yourself. Eh, eh, buenos días, mi nombre es César Pérez, soy el encargado del programa de Smart Governance para ir en la oficina de Centroamérica. Y eh, tenemos, eh, mi pregunta es para, para usted, Mardoqueo. Tenemos un poco. Uh, we have been more than one year working in Patsu. What is the difference that you have found? And um, we've seen it in your presentation, many institutions that you have provided and helped out with what you have in Patsu. What is the difference that you see in these programs with the ED program and small governance? In the programs that you have, uh, they have uh, cooperated with you in matters of technology within within your municipality. What is the uh, uh, different uh, programs that you see within this? What I would say it is the innovation as of Iris, Iris, and, and the uh, support that have provided us within this process. It is not a situation that imposes that it does not exist. Let's say uh, a rule of law that we can say that we had to uh, um, create all that process. I think it has been a combination up to a point of ideas the uh, 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 evaluations that uh, they provide us uh, during certain matters. And uh, when we talk about the usage of a uh, Facebook page, when there are uh, certain uh, uh, critiques, uh, in many instances, uh, words that are not adequate. And uh, you have uh, provided us with the idea as to we could overcome this and to provide the strengthening. Uh, the emphasis I make is your role has been very fundamental with this process and that have uh, uh, make us uh, move forward. And that's when I mark the difference, that you provide us the ability because we have our initiatives and you also have it uh, in parallel and you are uh, supporting us uh, with this uh, matter. Now is uh, unfortunately the end of the this outstanding uh, panel. 
Uh, we certainly want to thank you. You're all rock stars, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the king rock star, however, is uh, the mayor. And we just thank you so much uh, for sharing in such an interesting way. But more importantly, uh, we thank you for what you're doing for your citizens and the example that you're setting. Um, and thank you all, and thank you, everyone here in the audience, and the uh, people who are viewing uh, this program live. And we look forward to the next time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.